Stop the program dialogue reaching you from the stables on Liberty. The name remains Abdul Aziz Ahmed Kader. Well, 11th of October every year is declared as the International Day of the Girl Child. And I'm sure you will be wondering, I mean, I've often said it. If you don't have a wife yet, you must have a sister. If you don't have a sister, you must definitely have nephews. Uh, nieces, I beg your pardon. If you don't, I'm sure you have aunties. If you don't have any of those, definitely you must have a mother. You know, quite interesting. So, whatever you do, I'm sure uh, you definitely have a woman around you. And uh, every woman is once a child. And uh, we are all once her children, if you ask. Well, today uh, we shall be touching that other half, I mean, half, half of half line of the program. And, uh, well, maybe, um, what is the international, I mean, international girl child all about? I'm sure you will be wondering. Uh, the occasion marks the importance of adolescent girl child and the attempt at identifying their power and potential by opening opportunities for them. Um, it also aims at amplifying um, and uh, empowering the voices of adolescent girls uh, around the globe. Well, uh, throughout, uh, through observing this day, an attempt is made to talk about and eradicate the issues concerning the adolescent girl, and the issues around them are enormous. Well, I won't be talking about them because I have uh, two beautiful young girls in the house who will be doing justice to that. I don't know how this happened. I just said, get me two girls that we can talk about today. And they ended up getting me two Aishas. And, uh, well, am I excited? Well, I should be. My mother is Aisha. My wife is also Aisha. So, I, <laughs> I'm surrounded by Aisha. I have this morning, I have with me today, Aisha Taufik Lowell. Aisha, good to have you here with, with us. Thank you, sir. And Aishas are always known to be leaders. She's actually the head girl in our school, Destiny College in Kaduna. So, I mean, how does it feel to be the head girl? It feels so great to huh? be the head girl. With so many responsibilities. Yes. I'm sure, Charlie. Yes. Are, you the first, are you the first girl in your house? Yes. Oh, okay. No, no, I understand. And of course, our sister, also Aisha. Aisha Malari. Aisha, good to have you here. Thank you, sir. Are you, are, you, are you the first daughter in your house? Yes. Oh, you're also the first daughter in your house? Okay, incidentally. And it, what a coincidence, both of them, their parents don't even know each other, but their mothers are also Fatimas. Uh, <laughs> again, so a lot of coincidence there. Well, I let me start with you. <clears throat> it is your day, but we'll see. Uh, can you share with us the background activities toward declaring today as International Girl, as, as International Day for the Girl Child? Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. As we all know, today is International Day of the Girl Child. Mm -hmm. The move to dedicate a day to create awareness about the girl child started in 1995 at the World Conference on Women in Belgium, China. It was unanimously adopted as Belgian Declaration and Platform Action in 1995. The Belgian Declaration is the first to specifically call out girls' rights. On December 19, 2011, United Nations General Assembly adopted the resolution to declare October 11th as the International Day of the Girl Child. Well, quite interesting that. And then you have addition to that? Yeah. Um, good morning to all viewers out there. To add to what she just mentioned, mm. the main aim of the day is to promote girls' empowerment, fulfillment of their human rights. It also focuses on helping girls to live free from gender-based violence, harmful practices, molestation, rape. It's easy. Well, there, there are numerous. We will actually come to that. I, I didn't even talk about the team for this year, but of course, like I said, I have two Aishas here, and uh, I, I feel they are capable. If you have an Aisha in your house, you should understand what I'm talking about. I'm talking about. Well, Aisha, the team for this year. The team for this year, 2021, is yeah. my voice, our uh, equal future. Mm -hmm. Let me repeat that again. Um, our voice, our uh, equal future. My voice equal feature. That's that. I mean, that's actually a, a sub team of it. Uh, of course, looking at the, the digital generation, our generation. Uh, but but let, let, let's talk about that again a little bit about um, that. When we talked about digital generation, our generation, we're talking about the voices. To what extent can you say our digital age uh, has aided 
let's even look at it from the learning aspect. It enhances access to information. Okay. It makes learning more interesting. Mm. It has made the entire global world to become a very small village. With technology, we can know what is happening all over in the world. And though it has some disadvantages. Yeah. Well, nothing without disadvantage. Even the food we eat also have its own negative, <laughs> negative side. Yes. If you overeat, you know what happens at the end of the day. Uh, if you eat and go to bed too early, you know constipation will happen and the sleep might not come at the end. So the same thing with uh, te technology. Okay, um, but I shall be come to you. What can you say are some of the problems facing the girl child in our society today? Majority of the problems that, face, that the girl child face, we have child marriage, we still experience that in our society today. Child trafficking, child labor. And to interest to know that majority of the households out there are supposed to be one, be with their parents. Secondly, they are supposed to be in schools and not be used as a channel for making money by the parents. And we equally have issue of rape, not even by outsiders nowadays, by members of the same households. Child molestation is also there and so many other things. Sad reality of our time, you know, if we get to talk about the problem, the challenges, the girl child faces, it actually in us. We, we are in a situation today that even a father actually molests his own daughter. It's that bad. We are in a situation today where mothers even send their children into things like prostitution just to make money for them. We are in a situation where, I mean, even ritual within the same family members like Aisha said. I don't know, Aisha, Aisha you have anything to add to that? Challenges of the girl child. Early marriage. Okay. Which is. It, yeah. I, sometimes you lack words to even describe yeah, uh, the situation. Yeah. When you see girls your own age who should be in school, yeah. who should actually be adding value to their lives and others, being married off. I, I, I have always I have always said this that look, the problem might not actually be uh, that early marriage. Uh, the man she's getting married to is an educated man who will actually allow the girl to continue her education, for instance. Uh, some of us come from the family where the girl child is prioritized. I know in my family, before I get a thousand naira, my sisters must have getting three, four, five thousand naira. And uh, when I complain, they say, you are a man, you can fend for yourself, but there are girls, or you know, uh, among, among other things. I come from a family where if you come looking for a girl and the marriage, they say, well, she must finish her education. Do you agree or you don't? Uh, if you say you are ready to get married at that point, and the uh, parent will say, well, one, uh, let's have a, an understanding. The moment she gets married, I will continue paying her school fees until she finish. Uh, a wise guy will say, yes, I agree. And the moment they get married, they say, go and tell your dad, I'm now your husband, I'll pay your school fees, and I know your dad, you know. But a situation where a girl is married off to... A man who is not even educated, who doesn't value education, who will not allow her to continue her education, it becomes a problem. I've often said this. I married my wife when she's just she was just a diploma holder. Now four children all in the house. Now she finished her HND postgraduate at that level, and we are hoping she must actually continue again. Well, um, I let me continue. How do you think, as adults, we can help in curbing some of this problem? Well, just in so many ways, actually. Um, by the individuals, by the government and non-governmental organizations, popularly known as NGOs. And it's a culture in, our, in, our, in Africa today that every adult male and female should play a role of a father and a mother okay. to every girl out there. Okay. Encourage them, monitor them and counsel them and also encourage them to go to school and also put them in the right way of doing things. And for the NGOs, they can organize workshops trainings in schools, communities, churches and mosques. That will also help in covering all this program. Create awareness. Yes. And for the government also, they must provide um, adequate policies that will have the interest of the girl child. Okay. And adequate health care, bringing schools within easy reach of the children mm -hmm. and providing school facilities. That will be able to help the children and they will have, and most of the, uh, the community, they will have awareness about all these problems and they will try to avoid it. Mm. And also a public enlightenment will also help, especially in the rural areas. 
rural areas. Why, why the dress in that? When we talk about it, it, there seems to be a whole wall between a, whole, a wall of difference between those of us in urban areas and those in the rural areas. I shall Yeah. Well, as she said, creating awareness to parents, especially the rural parents, okay. on the education of girl child, not just sending a, a, a little girl go for trade or uh, hawking, hawking uh, yeah, like that. Begin. Actually, let me come to you. You, you know, um, incidentally, some of us are lucky to have, just like your parents, the first one as girl. So, <laughs> you know, to what extent can you say your parents have been of assistance, have been of help to you to get to where you are today? Actually, in so many ways that I can't even express. They've supported me through everything in my life, from my birth, to where I am today, they always encourage me to do what I want to do. They always tell me not to lose hope. They always, they always encourage me to have determination. That's why I think they support me so much, and I'm very grateful to them. Ashabalari. <laughs> <sighs> and she sighed. <laughs> it's so much that sometimes she lacks the word to actually explain. But, but, but when we talk about it, you know, because, one, you know, it's one thing for us to talk about parents, but as a girl child, mm -hmm. to what extent can you say your father has been influential to help you to get to where you are today? To the extent I can, I can, I never imagined in my life. Mm -hmm. Like, he was my support, my backbone. He did everything to me in life. I don't even know how to thank him. You love the words to actually describe. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't think, let me, let me come to you. To what extent can you say your father is, I, I don't know, are you closer to your father than to your mom? I'm closer to both of them. No, but you, no, you, can't, you must be closer to one person. I know you are close to both of them. I was with my dad. I'm closer uh, to that, I know it must be. <laughs> it must be a, why are you closer to your dad? Because they all support me. And we, we usually talk together with Mm. Sometimes we talk together to tease my mom, do things like <laughs> you that. You gossip with my mom. No, but, but again, you know when we talk about this, I've, I've said this, both of you have brothers in the house. Yes. Elders or younger ones? Younger, younger ones. Younger ones. But incidentally, you are the first, so you are, you are actually leading. Mm -hmm. you, you know, if that confidence, the confidence you have now, can, can you say it started from the home front, from your dad actually aiding you to have that confidence? Yes. How do you? You were just talking about the way you sit and discuss with your dad, for instance. Yes. Uh, because talking, to what extent can you say discussing with your dad actually give you the confidence that when you get to school, you can actually look into your teacher's faces and tell them, no, this is the truth, this is not the truth, no, this is the right thing, or this is not the right thing. In most cases, we see that most children are afraid of their dad. Mm -hmm. Which shouldn't be so. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that's why I think they don't have the confidence to face any other person in the school like their teachers. Because I think if, you're, if you can be close to your dad, oh. the person you're, you know that you're afraid of, you respect so much, you should be able to talk to other people too, yeah. like him. And it won't have helped you, just you're, you build that confidence to be able to talk to other people too. I shall very good. Just as she said. <laughs> <laughs> you know, quite, quite, quite interesting, you know. Um, I always tell my friends that if you don't have a girl child, yes, um, you are yet to have a child, <laughs> you know. Well, for some of us, we have boys. Um, I have three boys. I know what it entails with one girl. But that one girl seems to be equal to, you know, not in a way you might be actually be looking at it. But when you have a girl, try to relate with her, make her your best friend, and you wouldn't know what you are doing uh, for that girl. But later in life, she will actually realize from our relationship with virtually everyone. I always tell my wife, I can't tell my I can't tell my daughter better the secrets of men than she can. And um, if your daughter is not your best friend, then who will, or who do you think will be her best friend? Then she might be misled at the end of the day. Well, it is the International Day of the Girl Child, 11th of October every year, and today. With me on the program, two powerful Aishas. If you don't know the history of Aisha, I mean, go and just Google that name. I'm sure you will actually understand. Aisha Taufik Lawal, 
Aisha Balarabi. What is that? Is she's the head girl of our school, Testy College, Kaduna, and the second is our assistant. Aisha, thank you very much for being here. Thank you so much for being here. Hoping that you will enjoy the rest of the day and you will celebrate it to teach the men how to be a man yes, <laughs> or how to treat a lady. Yes. All right. Well, let's, and let, let, let's take a quick break. When we come back, we shall be looking at another issue. Of course, um, 13th of October is also uh, International Disaster Day. What are the issues around that? We shall be looking at that. We will be right back. Well, thank you for being there, welcoming you back from that break where we talked about the International Day of the Girl Child with those two wonderful girls. Well, I told you earlier that we will be talking about the International Day for Disaster Reduction. The 13th of October every year is actually the International Day for Disaster Reduction. In 2009, the United Nations General Assembly officially declared 13th of October uh, as the day to commemorate the day. The day celebrates how people and communities around the world are reducing their exposure to disasters and raising awareness about the importance of reigning in the risk that they face. Well, this year's theme is Disaster Risk Governance. Of course, I'm sure you know why that theme is very apt, considering what we have gone through with the COVID-19 pandemic. But, well, let's leave that. Our guest today is a Senior Program Coordinator of Disaster Management and Peace Building, talking about Mr. Fabite Bamidele. So, Bamidele, good to have you with us. Thank you very much. All right. Well, um, well let, let's start from that. I mean, why this year's focus is uh, important in disaster reduction uh, response in Nigeria? Well, thank you very much. Um, you will agree with me that in the last um, couple of years, uh, specifically uh, throughout last year, uh, we have been battling with not only the issues of um, maybe disasters, it has to do with natural disaster, but we have the uh, pandemic of the COVID-19, COVID yes. uh, which is still with us. And that is why for this year we're looking at the theme of um, uh, actually spotlighting the, the importance of international cooperation in overcoming uh, these two are challenges of natural disaster of COVID-19 okay. uh, pandemic. Uh, so this has been mainstreamed also into um, the disaster uh, risk reduction as it were. And of course, when we're looking at issues of uh, disaster in Nigeria, it is not just about um, disaster around COVID-19 now. Okay. We're looking at other natural disasters, just like um, uh, flooding disaster, and uh, which has uh, become a very perennial and um, very uh, common thing. Almost every year, you have um, almost um, uh, almost uh, uh, a half of the states of Nigeria and uh, even Abuja uh, uh, communities witnessing one case of a flooding or the other. So this time around, um, you look at the impact of COVID-19 on the people, how this has actually made people more vulnerable, how it has actually expanded the risks uh, which people go through. Okay, okay. And then when you now have the issues of the natural disaster like the flooding with it, you see that there's just that need for state and non-state actors to effectively come together to continuously raise that awareness um, to see how behaviors can actually be influenced okay. positively towards ensuring that people get to know they're first of all aware of what they need to do okay. about the disaster you know having understood what the disasters are then they are aware of what they need to do how they need to do it and you know the technicalities about it so that at the end of the day if this disaster eventually occurs or as it is occurring uh, they have that mechanisms and tools to actually ensure that the impact or the effects on them are not so you know devastating okay well, well this year's team is talking about disaster risk governance and we all do especially in a climate like ours, how dependent people are when it, we talk about issues uh, like this. Now, uh, what can we say is this gap between the people, governance, and uh, risk reduction? Well, when we talk about governance itself, I want to see governance not just about um, the governments. The government. okay. I want to see governance as being holistic, um, like um, it's a social contract. Uh, you have 
the governed and you have those in the uh, seat of power. Mm -hmm. and I think um, by and large for Kaduna, uh, most specifically, there's been a lot of awareness creation around issues of disaster, uh, risk reduction in the state. As an organization, Christian Heed had intervened in the first uh, sponsored um, uh, donor-funded eco-project on disaster risk reduction in uh, Kaduna State along Benue and Plateau State since way back since 2018. And uh, I think then we worked in um, Kaduna North uh, Kaduna South and Chikon local government areas. Um, we've had a lot of uh, support, especially from government agencies. Uh, when you look at uh, agencies like the State Emergency Management Agencies um, and other um, platforms uh, which have actually been established to support um, uh, the mandates uh, of the um, State Emergency Management Agencies. Okay. However, we still have gaps. Uh, gaps in the area of. Um, yeah, uh, I was actually going to <laughs> ask about what are the key gaps in response and prevention of disaster in the state? Yes, um, specifically um, in the areas of uh, um, effective response and coordination. You see, they say um, uh, a stitch in time saves time. Yes. Um, that's one of the areas where, as an organization, we have come in to see. What is it that we can actually do to ensure that there is timely response okay. when it comes to issues of disaster, the alerts? Okay. And that is by reason one, the early warning systems and signs. When the community people get to know what are the signs that actually you know, come before disaster occur, then they become aware. Oh, yeah. okay. Now, disaster has theater. The theater is the place where it occurs. Mm -hmm. And if something happens in one, maybe at, at your community, for instance, in Zango Kataf, mm -hmm. and you're looking at the people from state emergency management agencies in Kaduna mm -hmm. to respond, yeah. before someone from Kaduna town yeah, to gets to Zango, Zango Kataf and to that certain community, uh -huh. then a lot must have been affected. Now, it is about strengthening that coordination and capacity of the locals okay. to okay. first of all, they are the first responder okay. in the issues of disaster. When you strengthen their capacities to be able to actually respond, you know, to disaster, then the local, like for instance, now the Zangu Kataf local government, yeah. too, is capacitated in such a way and manner that local government, local emergency management committee yeah. is also joined in with the local community to support their information cannot pass through to the state emergency management mm -hmm. agency. Okay. Oh, this is what is happening in the social community. Uh, the community have been able to do this. The local government has been able to do this. Mm -hmm. And this is where we are and everything. So when the state emergency management agency now intervene on behalf of the state government mm -hmm. and the, the issue is still overwhelming, now you cannot call on the National Emergency Management okay. Agency. Yeah, so that coordination uh, needs to be strengthened. Okay. The capacity and the awareness of the people are about the disaster in, in their communities, yeah, in their area. Yeah. It needs to be strengthened. Yeah. And i tell you one thing, that uh, State Emergency Management Agency are supported by um, uh, Northeast um, Initiative, uh, Regional Initiative, NERI, okay. has actually done. It's what we call the hazard profiling. Hazard profiling makes you to understand and aware of possible hazards that can translate into disasters disaster in your communities. So it is not just about flooding, but what are other things? You know, you might something that you see as so beautiful that is giving you enjoyment, that is giving you happiness, could be hazardous. Okay. So how do you ensure that you manage it so that you don't translate into that, into disaster? You know, so. Um, these are part of the things, so awareness creation is something that uh, we need to strengthen, coordination is something we need to strengthen, um, capacity building is something we need to strengthen mm -hmm. as far as um, a response, emergency response, response, timely response, effective response yeah. to disaster is concerned in the states. I, I know one issue that has always been on the front burner is that response period from the time something occurred and the time uh, the agency that is actually supposed to be there respond to it has always been an issue. But again, uh, let's take Kaduna State for instance. We know Kaduna State has been one outstanding state in, in, in terms of um, social register, for instance. Uh, the issue of social protection has been one issue 
that we've been advocating for. So what role will you say a social protection um, mechanism, how essential can, they, can you actually say this are to focus on, at least from the part of the government? When well, we talked of risk uh, reduction. Well, um, as a matter of fact, um, I think uh, since the um, discourse around social protection policies no. and all that, uh, Kaduna State has done a lot of a very good job uh, when it comes to uh, ensuring that we have a policy around social protection. We have an agency of government that is saddled with the responsibility of uh, ensuring that yeah, the, so cool. uh, the social protection actually is activated and yeah. makes working. Um, I will not want to continue to sing the praise of the government, <laughs> um, but we will want to see how these policies itself translate Translates. into implementation. Okay. And not just implementation, but how the implementation actually covers those people that are actually vulnerable. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we've seen it, it's a document, um, the, 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 the governor of the state is very, very particular about it. Mm -hmm. I've met with, uh, in, the, in the development sector, I've met with a couple of um, our colleagues that have, even outside Kaduna, I met somebody in Sukutu and was actually saying, Kaduna State Social Protection Policy, this right. and that and everything. And I was like, wow, if somebody could be in Sukutu and can be talking about the social protection policy in Kaduna, it means that all highs are actually in Kaduna okay. State. Yeah. Uh, we have a very young girl who is driving that uh, Saudi so Arabia. <laughs> yeah. And so if we have that, and uh, the government of the state is uh, actually so committed into it, yeah. I think um, certain things that can actually be uh, embedded in that social protections uh, as kind of the mechanisms and tools. We'll, we are yet to say more of it, but we know um, social protection is meant to respond to, um, to, to, to a group of people, the vulnerable groups, uh, see how their well-being can actually be you know, prioritized in government policies and uh, programming implementation, both in planning and in, in, in implementation. implementation. So we would like to see a situation where you know, uh, Kaduna State, we are farmers. Kaduna State, and um, like all the states, we have women, especially the pregnant mm -hmm. women and the nursing mothers. Okay. Um, in Kaduna State, we have people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, how can the policies of government actually support these vulnerable group of people? It's very important. We know we've had our shares of uh, insecurity and challenges and everything, mm -hmm. and there have been various uh, attempts and responses to actually uh, support these victims, but how do we ensure that after that support, there are systematic monitoring and evaluation of this support to actually assess the impacts on them. Okay, okay. You see, when you do that and you are able to actually bring people from that, uh, that the, 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 the bottom ladder of, of poverty and people have that sense of responsibility, mm -hmm. they have that sense of commitment and they can see that these are the plans the government has for them and these are genuinely what the government is doing for them. Okay. So there is that way in which that collaboration can actually be strengthened. Because there's one, there's, there's, a, there's a difference between when you have a program and policies and you want to give it to the, people, it to the people, and when the people themselves see it so as yeah. their own. So sustainability is very important from ownership. Mm -hmm. And so that, that collaboration, that fission needs to actually be strengthened. And I think I, I, I want to believe that um, the government of the state is, is focused the government of the state is very genuine in one in, in its plan and everything. Mm -hmm. And for us to even have that agencies and the people leading on it and everything, it means that mandates have been given. And so there's going to be that social contrast in such a way that you can be able to say, oh, social so, so agency, you are responsible to do one or two, three, mm -hmm. four. Mm -hmm. But we have not been able to see anything. Okay. What are you doing no in such a way that... But it is very important because for you to be able to give to someone, you must be able to understand what the people need. need. So that fusion, that, that interaction must be established, that platform must be created to ensure that people get to know uh, what government has and government gets to know what the people want so that the planning can actually meet the needs and the aspirations of the people. Well, that is where the, another issue of the uh, OP, OP, OPD comes in, the Open Government Partnership. Uh, what, what again? When we talked about some of this uh, risk reduction, uh, what can you say are the current key drivers of disaster? Uh, you talked about flood, uh, flood in particular in the state, and what should communities be doing to protect themselves from its effects? 
I think the first thing is um, for us, um, let me uh, say that uh, aside from the social protection, uh, very quickly, we have what we call the contingency plan. The contingency plan in Kaduna State was actually reviewed in 2018 and thankfully that's, this has actually been reviewed again okay. because it's a living document that actually uh, shows what the states and local government as part of the government are closer to the grassroots and needs to be doing as far as forecasting and meeting the needs of the people in terms of um, responding to disaster and all that. Okay. So uh, there's the need for um, um, both um, state and local governments. When I mean local government, I mean local government authority. authority. So be aware of this contingency plan, okay. emergency response plan, so as to be able to actually, op, you know, a kind of funding when you're doing okay. budgeting. Yeah. It's, it's not just budgeting for budgeting, but budgeting for planning. Okay. If this this happens, what and what, what? can we do? You know, there's something we call stock taking, which is about getting some kind of non-food items and everything that are made ready in case it happens. Okay. Uh, now the state emergency agency has, the, has, has done the hazard profiling, uh, but the, the, there's the need to go further. Aside from having the hazard profiling and everything to actually determine some of those hazards mm -hmm. that are inherent in certain communities, there's the need for that awareness creation. Okay. Let people get to know. Then we have these attitudes and behaviors from the, from the side of the people. We know most of our peoples are farmers. We know land is very sacrosanct and very special to us. And so when you see people dealing with issues of land, they don't want to move away. Even when you ask them to move, okay, the water level is rising, the amount of water is, you know, is higher, and this and that. These are signs. But then people don't want to move even when you ask them to move. So these are part of the challenges we have, and these are part of the gaps. Uh, so the gaps is not only on the part of the government, okay. but we have a lot of gaps when it comes to the people that are actually at the center of the disaster. Okay. Well, I told you earlier that uh, Mr. Fabrice Bamidele is the senior program coordinator of disaster management and peace building, Christian Aid. Uh, but, but what role is Christian Aid playing in all this? Well, like because I said, you, you said it from the beginning. <laughs> the government alone cannot do it at all, at all. Um, since 2018, um, um, although Christian Aid had actually been in Kaduna State for uh, way back 2003, mm -hmm. uh, so but in 2018 specifically, um, we've been working on issues of disaster risk reduction in the states. I mentioned the fact that we have um, actually worked in three local government areas in the time past, okay. uh, talking about uh, four or uh, twelve local government areas and about uh, 27 communities. Oh. Uh, trying to see how we can strengthen issues of uh, disaster risk reduction and management across communities, states and local and state level. So currently we're working in Jema and Kaura local government areas of the state. Okay. Um, we have, uh, we're supporting also the um, state emergency management agency. Uh, in the last project we have established a platform which we call the disaster management um, uh, mitigation and management platform. Um, I think across the three states where we piloted this project, the disaster mitigation and management platform yeah. of uh, Cardinal State has been the most functional, the most effective. Um, not only because of the composition, but I think it's because of the zeal of the people. Okay. Uh, the DMMP is made up of um, relevant agencies and parastatas, even from the non-state actors, from the media, CSOs, that have certain mandate, mandate to also support the functions of the uh, of, of, of the of, 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 of uh, SEMA. Okay. For instance, when we say media, for instance, now, the, there's no way you want to talk about awareness creation, communication, coordination uh, that you, okay. that you without, the, without the media, mm -hmm. right? So we have the media, we have the civil society organizations, we have the police, we have the Nigerian uh, Red Cross, we have the road safety, we have the fire services, we have all these uh, relevant agencies that are supporting in uh, that platform, the DMMP. So we have it at the state level and we have what's called the Local Emergency Management Committee institutionalized at the local level. Mm -hmm. Then at the community level, where we have the theater of this disaster, we have what's called the Community Disaster Management Platform. Now, when you have these three platforms that has been established, mm -hmm. then you now try to build capacity, number one. After building capacity, now strengthening the coordination and mm -hmm. communication so that there's the real-time response in effective communications when it comes to disaster. It's a different ball game when you have um, you, you you have an injury on your left on your on your left leg mm -hmm. and you are holding your head. Somebody that wants to attend to you, you oh, what is wrong with your head and everything? Whereas 
it is happening on your left leg. So it is about that response, getting to know the spot and everything. And not only that, because most times when disaster occurred and governments want to intervene in the areas of maybe non-relief items or relief items to, um, to victims, you always see that, number one, there are certain things, certain people that are omitted in the high times government want to procure. Okay. And that is not just only the fault of government. Like for instance, you find persons with disability that must have lost his or her cane, yeah, maybe okay. needs wheelchair, okay. not some others that need uh, diapers and all that. But when you, are are never yeah, when you are strengthening community people to actually be uh, able to undertake what you call post-disaster monitoring uh, assessment, it will inform the local emergency management agency. Then the local government can say, okay, these and these are things that we have that we have in capacity uh, in, in, in our store that we can, give. we can give. And these are the number of people that have been affected. Then they are appropriately disaggregated. Okay. If 1,000 people are affected, you know how many are males, how many are females. Yes. Among the females, you know how many are nursing mothers, how many are uh, pregnant women. Among mm -hmm. the total population, you know about the aged, you know about the persons with disabilities amongst them and all that. So at the end of the day, uh, so the response is becomes more effective. So need, so need assessment. Exactly. Uh, we call it post-disaster assessment. assessment. And after the post-disaster assessment, which informed what the needs of the people are, ah. then there's what we call the post-disaster monitoring. Okay. Where you are giving something to people, mm -hmm. it is always very important for us to assess what has been the impact, impact and the effect of this them. thing mm -hmm. in cautioning the effect of the disaster on them. Mm -hmm. So these are part of the things uh, Christian Aid as an organization is doing. And for this time around, we're also working with uh, Corporation International, we call it COPI, uh, which is also handling the areas of the social protection of the uh, project. Although it's not only in Cardinal State, yes. we are doing it both in Cardinal and Sokoto State. Okay. And, so, and it is also to support effort of government also in the areas of in driving the social protection elements. Mm -hmm. So that, uh, as a matter of fact, you have seen now that there's a very thin line or it's, it is not, it is very difficult for you to divorce uh, disaster risk yes, reduction yes. for social protection because yeah. at the end of the day, all are trying to see how people that are vulnerable can actually be strengthened mm -hmm. to actually, you know, react to issues of uh, disaster. Well, I was actually going to ask because uh, this year's International Day for uh, this, uh, I mean, disaster risk reduction is all about governance. About, of course, like you said, governance is not just from government uh, angle alone. Mm. Uh, it's not just the elected and the electorate. Mm. Uh, even from the home, I'm sure uh, a breadwinner knows that he's also a governor there, yeah, and, <laughs> and, 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 and he, he needs to do that. Mm. But what, 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 what issue is because we can't talk about. Uh, disaster risk reduction mm. without talking about the environment itself. Mm. I mean, I live in a neighborhood where I'm having a running battle. You want to keep your environment as clean as possible, but then your, your neighbor is doing as much as possible <laughs> mm. <laughs> to worsen the situation, for instance. Uh, we just had the malaria vaccine, which the whole world is celebrating, for instance. And uh, what would people would say, I mean, with clean environment, even, you don't even need to even go into having the issue of malaria and all that things and all the so now how do we relate this issue of governance in terms of risk reduction and taking care of the environment itself you see the 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 in cardinal state for instance um aside from sema okay uh, which has its own mandates we have the minister of environment we have the Cardinal State Environmental Protection Agency yes, and all yeah. that. Mm -hmm. So all these have their mandates mm -hmm. and functions, their mm -hmm. rules. Um, some time ago, uh, the Disaster Mitigation Management Platform under the auspices of the State Emergency Management Agency and the Executive um, Secretary of SEMA, we went around some communities in Cardinal State. Okay. Um, I mentioned the issues of attitude and behavior earlier on. Okay. Uh, you'll see that the way we react to our environments, it is one critical factor that also, you know, triggers disaster. Okay. Okay. And you don't expect governments to come and do everything. Okay. No, it is not. Now we, we we saw houses almost in the midst of water, no. overgrown with grasses puddles of water and everything. Now, in such an environment, we saw women bringing out little children. These people are exposed already. Yeah. Now, malaria comes, malaria goes, or anything. You do not expect everything 
that government has to do. It has to do with the fact that people need to start changing their attitudes and behavior. Building on waterways yeah. is very wrong. Indiscriminate disposal, there is a lot of waste. waste, is very wrong. Sometimes we have this environmental sanitation uh, um, exercise, I think every last Saturday and everything. Mm -hmm. How many people will be that? <laughs> now, I ask the question, if you don't need to wait for governments before you drink mm -hmm. water when you are thirsty, must government be the one to come and care your environment, environment, your surroundings for you? No. But then, if government can also start enforcing now, you know, I remember during um, war against uh, yeah, in, yeah, in, in, the, mm. in the early 80s and yeah. everything, mm -hmm. if you do anything, you know that this and that and everything. Nigeria become so disciplined. Yeah. We were so, so disciplined. We I think if that era comes around yeah. and people are sanctioned, that is one way. Then, um, I say it again, it's about cooperation. Government needs to cooperate with the people, but the people need to also cooperate with the yeah. government. It's a total responsibility. You go to most of our markets and everything, um, the way people do things and everything. So the, uh, the, you, we need to start sensitizing people. You're, you're, you, you are sitting on, on, on a very good advantage position where you can reach out to the people to enlighten them, especially on how they must ensure that they have become more you know, environmental friendly in their disposition and attitudes. This is very key. Oh, you know, the, it's a popular uh, geographer, he said, if you take good care of your environment, your environment will also take good care of you. Definitely. But if you don't, of course, the, the environment will also retaliate. So, on this year's um, International Day for Disaster Reduction, marked every 13th of October, the team for this year, I told you, uh, is disaster risk uh, governance. And today, our guest, Dr. Fabite Pamidele, is the Senior Program Coordinator on Disaster Management and Peace Building with Christian Aid. Thank you very much for your time. It's my pleasure. All right. Thanks so very much. All right. Well, let's leave it there. When then the program comes, we shall have other guests when we shall be looking at other issues. The name remains Abdel Aziz Ahmed Kairi saying, please take care of your environment and it will definitely take care of you. If you don't, it will also retaliate. <laughs> have a wonderful day.